Between the founding of the Ottoman Empire in 1299 and its abolition in 1924, there were 36 Ottoman sultans. Of these, Suleiman the Magnificent ruled the longest and is undoubtedly the best known and most celebrated of them all. A contemporary of England's Tudor King Henry VIII, Suleiman was the 10th Ottoman Sultan since the dynasty was established in 1299. He inherited an already substantial realm thanks to the conquests of his father, Selim the Grim. His empire was larger than any ruled by his predecessors and one with a larger, more diverse population. Yet Suleiman himself presents a number of reasons for his fame. In holding power for almost 46 years in the early and mid-16th century, Suleiman expanded his father's territories and consolidated and formalized rule over the massive one billion acre Ottoman Empire, which spanned three continents, Asia, Europe, and Africa. Suleiman is also notable for the story about his love of the concubine and later his wife, Roxelana. And yet, if I were to categorize Suleiman as simply the greatest Ottoman Sultan who ever lived, this would reduce his importance and his influence. Because in truth, Suleiman was one of the most important rulers anywhere on earth. And this was a fact of which even his bitterest rivals in Europe and elsewhere were all too aware. Even today, almost 500 years after he came to power, it's Suleiman's vision that continues to provide the model of what we think of when our thoughts turn to the Ottoman Empire. And this is why Suleiman's reign is a turning point in the history of the Middle East. So without further ado, let's get started with a look at Suleiman the Man. He was born in 1494 in the Black Sea city of Trabzon in what today is northeastern Turkey. Suleiman was Selim the Grim's only son. At the age of seven, he was sent to the Ottoman capital of Constantinople. There he received a standard education for an imperial heir, studying among sub other subjects, military history, tactics, science, literature, Arabic, and of course, Islamic theology. When his stern father, the Grim, died in 1520, Suleiman inherited the Ottoman Sultanate without the fratricidal plots that had challenged his father, his grandfather, and many other of his predecessors and successors. Yet not even Suleiman was immune to such intrigue, as we'll see when we encounter a rather terrible chapter in his marriage to Roxelana. In terms of his physical appearance, we're fortunate to have a description of Suleiman from 1520, less than a month after his accession to power. Bartolomeo Cantarini, a member of the famous Venetian family then in Constantinople, wrote this eyewitness account. He is 25 years of age, tall but wiry, and of a delicate complexion. His neck is a little too long, his face thin, and his nose aquiline. He has a shadow of a moustache and a small beard. Nevertheless, he has a pleasant appearance, though his skin tends to pallor. He is said to be a wise lord, fond of study, and all men hope for good from his rule. And then there was his name. Suleiman is the Turkish and Arabic rendering of Solomon, the Old Testament king and one of King David's sons, whose name is a byword for wisdom and good governance. With Solomon honored as a prophet in the Islamic tradition, it was a name that could only enhance Suleiman's reputation. The romance of Suleiman and Roxelana is a love story that has inspired poets artists and composers for centuries, and been celebrated in plays, ballets, and orchestral compositions, including one notable work by Joseph Haydn, who was sometimes considered the father of the symphony. We know very little about the early life of Roxelana, except that she was a Christian slave girl, probably from Ukraine, but maybe Polish, and possibly the daughter of an Orthodox priest 
or then again possibly not. We don't even know her birth name. Although she became known as Roxolana, especially in the West, she's known in Arabic as Karima, the noble one, and in Turkish as Hurim, from a Persian word meaning the joyful or cheerful one. What is clear is that Roxolana entered the Sultan's harem as one of an unknown number of concubines. From this somewhat privileged, if enslaved and ultimately uncertain position, Roxolana became Suleiman's favorite consort. Eventually, she bore numerous children for him, including, most importantly, sons. And then, Suleiman did something that shocked the entire royal court. In a startling break with Ottoman tradition, the Sultan married Roxolana. Even more surprisingly, he granted the former Christian slave girl her freedom. Now, for the first time in Ottoman history, a concubine had become a Sultan's legal wife. And more than that, in the case of Roxolana, she was given the title Haseki Sultan, or favorite wife. That's right. Roxolana might have been Suleiman's favorite wife, but she wasn't his first. And her elevation inevitably attracted the jealousy of others in the harem. Not least the woman who had already borne Suleiman four sons. In order for the Ottoman dynasty to last and prosper, it was essential that there always be the smoothest possible transition of power from one sultan to the next. Naturally, this led to all sorts of palace intrigues, infighting, lies and power struggles. And the harem was one of the worst places for this, as mothers of sons did everything in their power to ensure that one of their boys would inherit the coveted sultanate. For all of our romantic ideas of Roxolana, she was as keen as anyone else to see her son, Selim, inherit. I say keen, but perhaps desperate is a better choice of word in view of the alternatives. Because the sad fact was, during this time in history, in the Ottoman Empire, boys who didn't inherit tended to be murdered, ritually strangled. In this way, there was no chance of them or their supporters posing a challenge to the throne at some future date. So what was a mother to do? To cut short a lot of intriguing, Roxolana persuaded Suleiman that his eldest son of another wife was plotting against him, and so the father ordered the execution of his own child, his firstborn son, Mustafa. With such a ruthless pursuit of power, it's easy to see why, in spite of the sometime romanticized view some in the West have of Roxilana, in her day, she attracted no shortage of enemies and detractors, both in and outside the imperial harem. It's very interesting to note that among Western writers, poets, and playwrights of the 16th and 17th centuries, Roxolana was portrayed more often than not as little more than a cunning, manipulative, even evil woman who bewitched Suleiman into killing his son Mustafa. Naturally, in keeping with another common prejudice in Europe at that time, it was a Jewish witch who helped Roxolana to bewitch the hapless Suleiman. In highlighting the evil, the darkness and danger of a woman like Roxolana, these writers were, consciously or otherwise, reflecting the general fear of the Ottoman Empire at that time. However, in the 18th and 19th centuries, when the Ottoman Empire was seen as less of a threat to Europe and instead recognized as a waning power, writers' views of Roxolana changed accordingly. Gone was the dangerous and manipulative woman, replaced now by a sensual Roxolana. Now, if she charmed Suleiman, it wasn't with spells, but with all the guile and sexual wiles that Western, typically male, authors put at the heart of any tale of harem life. And the Ottoman Empire 
instead of a dangerous polity to be feared, was becoming an exotic and desirable quantity to be plucked like a peach. With her own son, Selim, as heir apparent, he would eventually become Selim II, Roxilana's position in the palace was secured. In a further upending of the old order, Roxilana, after she passed childbearing age, wasn't dispatched to the provinces, but instead remained at Suleiman's side. Roxilana would become arguably the most influential female political figure in more than 600 years of Ottoman history. She was certainly the first sultana, or sultan's wife, to advise her husband on an official footing. It's interesting to read the literary outpourings of men of power. In the case of Ottoman sultans, many of whom aspired to be great poets, it's especially interesting to see what pen names some of them took for themselves. In Suleiman's case, he called himself Muhibi, or the lover. And in the following lines written for Roxolana, it's easy to see why. He wrote, Throne of my lonely niche, my wealth, my love, my moonlight, my most sincere friend, my confidant, my very existence, my sultan, my one and only love, the most beautiful among the beautiful, my springtime, my merry-faced love, my daytime, my sweetheart, laughing leaf, my plants, my sweet, my rose, the only who does not distress me in this world, my woman of the beautiful hair, my love of eyes full of mischief, I'll sing your praises always. I, lover of the tormented heart, Muhibi, of the eyes full of tears, I am happy. It should be said that life in Suleiman's court wasn't all plotting and poetry. Let's now look at the business of empire, including conquests and lawmaking, and the bureaucracy that binds them together. It was Suleiman's father, Selim the Grim, who in less than a decade had tripled the size of the Ottoman Empire. Suleiman's own conquests were not on the same scale, but they were no less important. Picking up where his father had left off, Suleiman started his reign by pushing further into Europe. In 1521, a year after he came to power, Suleiman captured the city of Belgrade and the southern and central portions of the Kingdom of Hungary. Later, his historic 1526 victory at the Battle of Mohac secured Ottoman rule in much of Hungary and other parts of Central Europe for centuries. Further westward progress was halted, however, after he twice failed to take Vienna in 1529 and 1532. Suleiman would go on to capture Baghdad from the Persian Safavids in 1535. This not only secured the whole of Mesopotamia, but also provided the Ottomans with direct access to the Arabian or Persian Gulf. Seizing Baghdad also meant that this Turkish superpower now controlled every former caliphal capital, Medina, Damascus, Baghdad, and Cairo. Supported by his expanding navy, Suleiman then extended Ottoman power along the coast of North Africa, from Egypt to Algeria. Elsewhere in the Mediterranean, Suleiman lent his navy, ships, admirals, sailors and all, to help an ally in need, the King of France. The size and shape of the empire, which had grown so much under his father, Selim the Grim, was thus both extended and brought into sharper focus under Suleiman. His acquisition of North African territories beyond Egypt to Algeria's border with Morocco proved important in the growth of the empire and in its eventual decline. Suleiman also established diplomatic ties with any number of foreign kingdoms and empires, welcoming and housing their ambassadors and other representatives in his own imperial capital. This allowed foreign dignitaries to see Ottoman greatness firsthand 
and report the same back to their own lords and masters. There's often talk in our own time of the so-called clash of civilizations, an idea that some permanent and irreconcilable divide exists between the West and the Muslim Middle East. Setting aside for now the fact that European history is full of bloody clashes, there are also numerous examples of alliances between European and Middle Eastern states. The Franco-Ottoman alliance between Suleiman and Francis I of France was among the first. To quote Henry Kissinger, countries don't have friends, they have interests. And in this instance, France and the Ottomans shared a common antipathy towards Hungary. And so, led by Suleiman's legendary admiral, Barbarossa, Ottoman forces helped the French capture Nice, Corsica, and other Mediterranean prizes. The Franco-Ottoman alliance lasted until well after the deaths of the French king and Suleiman alike. In fact, it remained in force for another two and a half centuries. Now, while conquests are all well and good, empires that grow rapidly without an efficient functioning bureaucracy will fall apart again just as fast. What made the biggest difference under Suleiman was the development of a single bureaucratic system across the length and breadth of the Ottoman Empire, from North Africa to the Black Sea, and from Hungary to Baghdad. In the modern era, there is a highly developed suspicion, even aversion, towards bureaucracy. By definition, nobody wants too much bureaucracy. But in its best face, bureaucracy allows the smooth running of operations in government and in business. And in the Ottoman Empire's example, it guaranteed centuries of survival. What was also remarkable about this bureaucracy was that it allowed the two main languages of state, Arabic and Ottoman Turkish, to live aside, alongside each other with officials able to function in both languages. Arabic, the language of the Quran, was always present for religious matters. While anyone who wanted to work in the temporal or secular world of government had to use Turkish. And while the Ottomans didn't worry much about ethnicity, they were interested in their subjects' distinct confessional identities. The Ottomans, naturally, put their own faith at the top of the different religious groups. They also had, under Muslim Sharia law, a responsibility to protect all so-called people of the book, that is, Jews and Christians who were living in their realms. This idea of protection for non-Muslims was established in the earliest days of Islam, and while it has certainly not always been observed by Muslim states, such failings are the exception, not the rule. Putting aside the injunction to protect Jews and Christians, it made sense in purely pragmatic terms for the Ottomans to rule over happy rather than unhappy subjects. The more legal rights and protections everyone had, the less likely there were going to be outbreaks of sectarian unrest or violence. This, then, was Suleiman's challenge, to draft and put into place a single unified legislative code that protected all subjects, regardless of religion. Drawing up such a legal code was hard enough, but Suleiman's task was complicated further by two factors. First, any laws he drafted couldn't contradict Sharia law, that is, Islamic jurisprudence. Suleiman's formal title, Kanuni, meaning lawgiver, refers specifically to the secular legal system he created, which covered such issues as criminal law, property rights, and taxation, all vitally important for the smooth running of the empire. The second factor that complicated his task was that in trying to put a single legal code into practice, he was confronted by nine distinct pre-existing legal systems, one by each of his predecessors. So the first thing Suleiman did in this regard was to collect all existing judgments 
and cut out any duplicates. After removing this legal dead wood, he also removed laws that were contradictory. Ottoman sultans and their lawyers had been drawing up ad hoc laws for more than 200 years by this stage, so you can imagine what a mammoth task this must have been. When he'd finished the Qanuni Osmani, or Ottoman Code, it provided the basis of an imperial law that would last for more than 300 years, until the mid-19th century. Without this legal code and the strong bureaucracy that lay behind it, it's highly unlikely that the Ottoman Empire would have lasted as long as it did. Together, they sustained the empire, even when it went through extended periods of weak or incompetent leaders at the helm. Now let's consider another important legacy of Suleiman's rule, the look of the Ottoman Empire, a look that still dominates the skyline of Istanbul and other former imperial Ottoman cities. Suleiman's creation of a distinct architectural style, like his success in establishing a strong bureaucracy and systematic legal code, came about because of two factors, his personal vision and his length of tenure. But Suleiman's own ideas would hardly have been enough to create this Ottoman look. Rather, Suleiman employed the most talented of that profession alive in his day, Mimar Sinan, or Sinan the architect. The son of a stonemason, Sinan was born in Anatolia around 1490 and received a technical education that was the foundation of his life's work. He spent much of his early professional career working as an army engineer, traveling and campaigning with one of the Ottoman army's elite Janissary Corps. In this military role, Sinan not only developed better fortifications and defensive structures, but he also learned how best to undermine the building work of others, i.e. how to break sieges through the use of mining and the best placement of explosives. Sinan later transformed his military engineering expertise into civilian architecture and non-military engineering. He became proficient at such everyday or common or garden projects as building roads, bridges and aqueducts. Understanding better than most the impact and effects of earth movement, natural and or man-made, on buildings, foundations and ramparts, Sinan was an early proponent of designing earthquake-proof structures. This was especially useful in the Ottoman heartland of Anatolia, an area that's still prone to earthquakes. It wasn't until he was approaching the age of 50, however, that Sinan found his true calling. That's when he attracted the patronage of the Sultan and was appointed Chief Royal Architect. Simplicity itself his orders from the imperial leader were to create the finest religious and civil buildings possible. And for most of the next 50 years, until his death at the age of 98, Sinan proceeded to do just that. During his lifetime, he oversaw the completion of some 300 major building projects, including mosques, schools, bathhouses and bazaars. As a direct contemporary of Michelangelo, Sinan inspired comparisons between the two great men, one in the West and one in the East, which comparisons are both just and appropriate. If I were to highlight just a couple of examples of what Sinan built while working for Suleiman, these would be the eponymous Sulemania or Suleiman's Mosque and the Selimini Mosque in Ederni the Ottomans' former capital. The first of these, the Sulemania Mosque, was built between 1550 and 1558 and remains the largest purpose-built mosque in Istanbul today. I say purpose-built because Suleiman's Mosque isn't as large as one of the city's most famous churches, the Hagia Sophia, which was converted to a mosque after the Ottomans captured the city in 1453. In constructing the Sulemania, 
Sinan self-consciously echoed the majesty of the earlier Byzantine domes of the Hagia Sophia, while also applying numerous elements of distinctive Islamic architecture. The most obvious of these are the minarets, from which the five times a day call to prayer was traditionally made. Minarets, the spire-like ornamentations typically found at one or more corners of larger mosques, are without question the most distinctive feature of mosque architecture. In the case of the Sulaymaniyya Mosque, each of the four minarets stands almost 250 feet tall. According to one Ottoman tradition, a mosque with four minarets indicated that a sultan had endowed it, whereas mosques endowed by princes or princesses could have two minarets, and all others were limited to a single minaret. Sinan would continue to work for Suleiman's successors, Selim II and Murad III, and it was while working for Selim II that the second of our two examples of Sinan's architectural genius was built, the Selimiyya Mosque in Edirne, located in modern-day Turkey, near the borders of Bulgaria and Greece. Sinan considered this his greatest single project. Built between 1569 and 1575, it's rightly hailed as a high point in Islamic architecture. Because while Sinan deliberately borrowed certain Byzantine architectural styles in designing the Sulaymaniyya Mosque, the Selimi is a more consciously Ottoman structure. With its massive dome and four lofty minarets, the Selimiya Mosque is actually just one part of a wider complex, the centerpiece of a community of buildings that includes a hospital, schools, steam baths, shops, and a cemetery. It's interesting to note that at the same time Sinan was creating his masterpiece in Ederne, the Italian Renaissance architect Andrea Palladio was publishing in Venice the Four Books of Architecture, which would contribute to making him one of the most influential architects in European history. Even after his death in 1588, Sinan's legacy lived on in the many young apprentices he trained. Sinan's protégés would go on to build some of the most iconic buildings in the Muslim world, including, perhaps most famously, the Taj Mahal in Mughal, India. It's fitting to note that Sinan also had a hand in memorialising his erstwhile master, Suleiman, and Suleiman's wife, Roxelana. In the garden behind the Sulaymaniyya Mosque, Sinan built tombs for each of them. Sinan himself is buried just a short distance away in a tomb that he also designed for himself. Two qualities in particular qualify the reign of Suleiman the Magnificent or Suleiman the Lawgiver as worthy of being considered a turning point in the history of the Middle East. The first is its sheer length. Having come to power at the age of 25, he ruled for 46 years until his death in 1566 at the age of 71. Obviously, length of tenure alone isn't any qualification for greatness. In the hands of an incompetent ruler, this time in office would have been disastrous, easily long enough to wreck a great empire. No. The second factor that allows us to call Suleiman's reign a turning point in the history of the Middle East is the energy and the vision he brought with him. It would guarantee the Ottoman Empire's continuing vitality for centuries, even as it was later ruled by a series of incompetent and ignoble sultans and their venal viziers. Time doesn't permit us to look at the record of the 26 Ottoman sultans that followed Suleiman. Suffice to say, few, if any of them, were his equals. And while we're talking of peerless individuals, let's close by reminding ourselves of the great love in Suleiman's life, Roxelana. Poetry in the Ottoman Empire 
long enjoyed preeminence among the creative arts. Yet poets never received as much support or encouragement as they did under Suleiman. The following ranks among the most famous, most enduring, and most revealing lines of poetry that Suleiman ever wrote. In essence, it states that he was more grateful for his good health than he was impressed by his power, that the job of a sultan comes with a lot of headaches, and that what really matters is remembering that God Almighty remains the almighty leader. He wrote, The people think of wealth and power as the greatest fate, but in this world a spell of health is the best state. What men call sovereignty is a world of strife and constant war. Worship of God is the highest throne and happiest of all estates. <laughs>